And welcome to our talk on the role of documentary in shaping public policy. Um, this is part of our media and public policy series that, we're launched this, that we've launched this year to really look at the role of various types of media in shaping public policy. And in our many discussions about how we were going to do this series, you know, we thought, and many of you have been to um, some of the past speakers, as you know, we're hosting Tom Brokaw tomorrow. So we've looked at sort of the more, you know, we've looked at social media, we're looking at traditional media, we're looking at different ways that media shape public policy. And it seemed to me that we couldn't do this if we didn't look at the role of documentary. Um, so we have two wonderful representatives representatives of documentary to talk today. Um, Purcell Carson is actually here at the Wilson School right now, though I'm a Brown grad and um, I'm very proud to say she's actually one of ours. <laughs> so, so but, but we both work here. Um, and so she's a documentary filmmaker and editor and um, as I said is working here, uh, has won lots of awards for her work. Um, Emily Holland is a Princeton grad uh, and is also a TV producer, human rights scholar, and a co-author of And Still Peace Did Not Come. As I said, both of them have won many awards, but I'm not going to take lots of time to tell you about them. I'd rather have you um, listen to their work in terms of uh, and show you what they've done. Thanks. Hi. Um, this is one of my uh, favorite topics of conversation. I think that the, the role of documentary in, in public policy, and it's a meaty one, so it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon to talk briefly um, about, about it. Um, this is also, I think, a, t a timely conversation always, um, but also a very old conversation. And so I want to look back to the past a little bit as I frame it. Um, and when filmmakers talk about our role in public policy, uh, we think of it as part of that classic debate about whether art is a mirror of society or really a hammer with which to shape it. I think documentary filmmakers are, are particularly attracted to this debate because we can never really decide whether we're artists, are we journalists, are we advocates, who are we? And so it's really refreshing to come to a public policy school that has kind of preempted that conversation and only wants me to talk about the hammer. <laughs> so in addition to my own experience, which I will uh, get to, I want to talk about three films today, one from 1960, one from 1994, and one from 2006, and use them to kind of draw very loose frames of this discussion. I want to start in, uh, with an inconvenient truth, kind of an obvious place. Um, it's a great purpose for, uh, for this afternoon because, not only because it's kind of synonymous now with public policy and public conversation and documentary, but also because filmmakers, activists, advocates, and funders all study it in the hopes that they can kind of replicate its impact. This summer, the CEO of the BBC's Channel 4 published a report called Beyond the Box Office, New Documentary Valuations, that was a case study of an inconvenient truth. The BBC report cites lots of compelling um, anecdotes about how the film is used in schools, how it was featured in government debate, and how top management of companies like Marks and Spencer's saw the film and kind of were moved to change their company's carbon footprint. That's important, but that's in the introduction to the report. The goal of the report is really to devise a methodology um, by which to measure some, what they call the social return on investment and, what, and to determine whether the man who paid for the film, Jeff Skoll from eBay, whether he got his money's worth. There are equations in this report. Which is not to say that that's bad, but to say that figuring out how to use documentary has become really big business for a lot of people, not just filmmakers. In addition to philanthropists, there are activists who've come to believe, probably rightly, that we live in a very, very visual time and that learning how to master visual media is really important. Um, there are journalists who are trying to find and are sometimes forced to find new forms of expression and new outlets. And there are art artists who are trying to figure out how to work and be relevant in a time of shrinking arts budgets. All these people really want to understand the hammer. They want to know what it looks like, they want to know how it works. Uh, they want to know how today's hammer is different from hammers in the past. And most importantly, they want to know where can they get a hammer. So let's talk about hammers and look at some of the stuff that I love. I want to show you uh, four minutes of the beginning of an hour-long film from 1960 
that was shown on CBS. Some of you will recognize it instantly, I hope. But regardless, when you watch, think about how the craft of it conceives the, its role in public policy. Um, as a film, it's a little slow. This is 1960. But we're only going to watch four minutes, so please don't get impatient. You. OK. Like this. Over here. Seven cents. All the day, John. Over here. Seven cents today. We're paying today. We're paying more in the body of town. Seven cents. Seven cents. Seven cents today. Seven cents today. Seven cents. Seven cents. Seven cents. All day, jumping. All I can do is the bag. Eight shot of box and you guarantee you if you pull today and we pull what we got to pull today, you have $11 in your pocket. This is not taking place in the Congo. It has nothing to do with Johannesburg or Cape Town. It is not Nyasaland or Nigeria. This is Florida. These are citizens of the United States, 1960. This is a shape up for migrant workers. The hawkers are chanting the going peace rate at the various fields. This is the way the humans who harvest the food for the best fed people in the world get hired. One farmer looked at this and said, we used to own our slaves, now we just rent them. The Secretary of Labor looked at the migrant plight and said, I think they're the great mass of what I've called uh, the excluded Americans. They are people who cry out, the workers and their children and their wives, who cry out for some assistance and uh, whose uh, plight is a shame. It's a shame in America. The president of the American Farm Bureau Federation, the largest farmers organization, says, I think that uh, most uh, social workers would agree that it's better for a man to be employed, even if his capacity is such as uh, to limit his uh, income. And uh, we take the position that it's far better to have thousands of these folks who are practically unemployable, earning some money, doing some productive work for at least a few days in the year. This is an American story that begins in Florida and ends in New Jersey and New York State with the harvest. It is a 1960 Grapes of Wrath that begins at the Mexican border in California and ends in Oregon and Washington. It is the story of men and women and children who work 136 days of the year and average $900 a year. They travel in buses. They ride trucks. They follow the sun. Well, I don't know. It don't look like we'll ever get ahead. I guess we'll just have to keep going until we can find something better. A minister named Cassidy, who works with them, says, they are just as bad as the slaves. Only on name they are not the slaves, but in the way they are treated, they are worse than slaves. And somebody has to make a thousand of dollars out of his sweat. Is that a slave or not? They are the migrants, workers in the sweatshops of the soil, the harvest of shame. Brought to you tonight by Philip Morris Incorporated, makers of Marlboro, filter cigarette with the unfiltered taste. Now, Edward R. Murrow. I wanted to get to Edward R. Murrow and the cigarettes. Um, and uh, I, could, I could talk about this for a long time. It's so interesting to me. This aired. Um, on, on Thanksgiving Day, it was an hour-long program and aired on Thanksgiving Day on CBS Evening News in 1960. Mm -hmm. And even if you haven't seen An Inconvenient Truth, you can see the obvious connections. Advocacy journalism is in many ways the same across time. Um, but you can all, and I, 
we can, there's so many thing, things about the poetics of this that we can talk about, but I want us to talk a little bit about the differences as we rush through to today. Um, the institutions making the work are really different. You know, CBS Evening News and the people who funded um, An Inconvenient Truth are worlds apart. The journalistic qualifications of the people who make this work is really, really different. The audience, as I said, everyone in America on Thanksgiving, um, and distribution is very different. Um, but specifically, I want to compare these two advocacy films, this one and An Inconvenient <laughs> Truth, um, and the way that they define their own role in public policy. And that's easy to do because both of these films know exactly what they want. And the end of each of these films, separated by almost 50 years, um, ends with, with what's become known as the call to action. People love the call to action. So um, perhaps you remember this one from um, An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, this is what Davis Guggenheim and Al Gore ask for at the end of the film. And I have to take a drink of water before I read it because I'm going to try to go really fast. OK, they say, the climate crisis can be solved. Here's how to start. Go to climatecrisis.net. You can reduce your carbon emissions by efficient energy, energy efficient appliances and light bulbs. Change your thermostat, weatherize your house, recycle, build a hybrid car. No, buy a hybrid car, ride a bicycle. <laughs> Use light rail and mass transit. Tell your parents not to ruin the world you live in. If you're a parent, join with your children to save the world they will live in. Switch to renewable sources of energy. Call your power company to see if they offer green energy. Vote for leaders who pledge to solve this crisis. Write to Congress. If they don't listen, run for Congress. Plant trees, lots of trees. Uh, speak up in your community. Call your radio stations and newspapers. Insist that America freeze CO2 emissions and join international efforts to stop global warming. Reduce our dependence on foreign oil. Help farmers grow alcohol fuels. Raise fuel economy standards. Require lower emissions from automobiles. If you believe in prayer, pray that people will find the strength to change. In the words of the old African proverb, when you pray, move your feet. Encourage everyone you know to see this movie, learn as much as you can about the climate crisis, then put your knowledge into action. It's fascinating and it's kind of weird. Okay, let's compare that to 1960. Oh boy, okay. Um, let's see. Here's this one, not this one yet. There will, of course, be opposition to these recommendations. Too much government interference, too expensive socialism. Similar proposals have been made before. In fact, 150 different attempts have been made in Congress to do something about the plight of the migrants. All except one has failed. The migrants have no lobby. Only an enlightened, aroused, and perhaps angered public opinion can do anything about the migrants. The people you have seen have the strength to harvest your fruit and vegetables. They do not have the strength to influence legislation. Maybe we do. Good night and good luck. This is so interesting. It comes after, I should have said this beforehand, it comes after he picks up a piece of paper and reads the seven pieces of legislation that the President's Committee proposes and what he wants and, and what uh, the president and, and they proposes that we do about migrant labor. It's really fascinating to me that this defines what it wants so specifically and so narrowly. And on the one hand, that seems really old school and kind of simple-minded. It draws this really tight line between journalist, journalistic inquiry to one broadcast of a documentary, to public awareness, to legislation. On the other hand, it seems really wisely realistic about the rocky road ahead. It's, it thinks about how hard it is for a documentary to really make a difference. And if you've seen recent films about migrant workers, you know that Murrow isn't wrong to be worried. Al Gore and Davis Guggenheim seem kind of all over the map by comparison. Or perhaps, on the flip side, they've internalized all those personal is political messages of the 60s and 70s and are looking for a broader type of engagement. I think most people who measure the social impact of media today would argue that the latter is true. For instance, let me show you how one organization thinks about it. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. 
So remember Moreau's tight line. Now we've moved to concentric circles. The fledgling fund is one of several new organizations, private organization, that channels private money to documentary and gives money every year to the outreach campaign for films. These campaigns are where a lot of private foundation money is going right now. The Sundance Documentary Fund, formerly the Soros Fund, now gives almost as much money to films after lives as it does to their production. The Fledgling Fund has published a number of interesting working papers on things like how to assess creative media's social impact and from distribution to audience engagement, social change through film, all of which are available on their website if you're interested. Um, it's interesting to see how they take apart Murrow's narrow line, really, that kind of one bold hammer stroke, and articulate each little piece of it. Everything they do gets tallied in this world. I'll name just a few of the things that they're measuring to measure the role of, uh, of the documentary, and that they're also paying generously to improve the numbers on. They care about audience size, <coughs> diversity of audience, press coverage, participation in facilitated dialogues, blogs, social network sites, website hits, Facebook friends, tweets, op-ed letters, number of organizations using the film, screenings with policymakers, and longevity of the film. Only at the very outer circle of this do you get down here, do you get to social change, which is where they've put legislation. On the one hand, this model is really, really aspiring for small local projects. You can make a tiny film up here in the center circle and slowly build the world, build your world of that film, find an audience, make incremental change. This is kind of Netflix's long tail in action. And while documentary, it's taken documentary filmmakers a while to get used to this world, Netflix is a really important source for getting that word out. And films' lives are now incredibly long. And they do grow according to this kind of model. The other thing that's interesting is right there at the center, where it says quality film. As an editor, I really like the way the Fledgling Fund reminds us that for documentaries to have a powerful impact, they need to be good. I don't really measure good in the same way that they do. Uh, which is festival acceptances level and depth of distribution awards and reviews. I sort of like to think it's good just because it's good, but the point is the same. The days of Murrow's bull bully pulpit are long gone. Now, to get a chance to participate in the public conversation, to reach all of these outside rings, you have to earn your popularity. Documentaries which want to reach beyond a tiny grassroots audience are forced to compete in a hypersaturated media world. Instead of lamenting that fact, which I think is kind of tired and pointless, I want to use my next example to talk about how documentary storytelling got to the place where it can compete in that world. Um, and despite today's media climate, it really does often succeed in reaching a lot of people. I'm not saying that there isn't a place for like homey grassroots media, but that's not what Jeff Skoll is looking to pay for. In the equation of social return on investment, you get extra points for speaking to more people, and you get extra points for speaking to people who are not in the choir of the people closest to your center circle. And people, so it's important to think about how documentary can do that. How did our hammer become so alluring? To talk about that, I think a lot of how that happened happened in the evolution of documentary in the 60s and 70s. Um, but to talk uh, about it specifically, I want to zoom forward to the 1990s and to my next BBC executive. The longtime commissioning editor for documentary at BBC's Channel 4, Nick Fraser, is a huge champion of American documentary, specifically the character-driven, story-heavy documentaries that he buys and shows on television in England. He kind of overstates the case in a lovely way. So I'll just quote him. Imagine the accent, OK? <laughs> in the 1990s, he claims, you have this real explosion of talent coming from America. He thinks Americans do have a special affinity for the process of making documentary. I really wish I could do the accent. Some deep, compulsive empiricism that lends itself to making marvelous documentaries. Some kind of literalism that makes Americans not want to let go of a subject until it's perfectly described. 
That last bit might be a little bit of a backhanded compliment. But anyway, he continues by saying, the triumph of the American documentary coincides with the collapse of any pretense of seriousness in the American media. We can discuss that. It's a period in American life where documentaries have taken over from a lot of other forms of expression. They're really the only original form of cultural innovation of our time, and their impact is comparable to what happened in American new journalism in the 1960s. That might be a little much, but I like the direction he's pointing in. He's talking about new techniques, not only in observational cinema, but also in storytelling. And he goes on to locate this renaissance in documentary in one film, Steve James's Hoop Dreams. We could actually use many examples, but I found this fabulous vintage trailer for the film, which is succinct. The film is two hours and 50 minutes. Um, and it really touches on the things that I want to look at here. And I really want us to get a taste of this in our mouths before we go forward. So. <laughs> Crazy music for a movie about blacks and inner city Chicago. It begins with a game, with a basket and a ball. It becomes a journey of heartbreak and hope from city streets to the brink of fame. The amazing story of two boys and two families struggling against the odds. My mother, God bless her, she's always said to me, this America, ah, you can make something of your life. Against the system. You have to realize you can make their team win. To make a dream come true. All I ever dreamed about was playing in the NBA. me will I remember them if I make it I tell them will you remember me if I don't who dreams an extraordinary true story a unique motion picture experience <laughs> This trailer really encapsulates a lot of things that, that, that are so important to documentary now and so important to what's get fun, what gets funded, what gets talked about, and, uh, and what people see. Here you notice the rise of individual characters, the role of story, in this case a kind of novelistic and eventually tragic journey through youth. The way, and here documentary is no longer the spinach in our media diet. It's wildly entertaining and richer and yummier just because it's true. It's glamorous, both in the way that it comes into the world. And like new journalism, the social commentary is here. The participation in the public conversation is here. But it's all very oblique. And if you try to pick it up and say what that commentary is, it evaporates in your hands. Um, that might be something that it's harder for funders to quantify and think about. Um, this documentary really pulls all the cinematic strings. And it, in this case, this is much more mirror than hammer. So the question is, why am I showing it here when I said we were talking about the hammer? What does this have to do with public policy, Al Gore, and solving the climate crisis? I want to show you the 90 seconds that I feel makes Al Gore's PowerPoint presentation about global warming into a movie for today's audiences. I'd argue that these are the 90 seconds that made America care insofar as we do about global warming. Sorry, my 
full screen thing, so. April 3rd, 1989. My son pulled loose from my hand and chased his friend across the street. He was six years old. The machine was breathing for him. we were possibly going to lose him. He finally uh, took a breath. We stayed in the hospital for a month. It was almost as if uh, you could look at that calendar and just go, and everything just flew off trivial, insignificant. He was so brave. He was such, uh, he was such a, a brave guy. Just turned my whole world upside down and then shook it until everything fell out. My way of being in the world, it just changed everything for me. How should I spend my time on this earth? This is totally irrational, but it works. And Davis Guggenheim has said that the reason that this film works is that the directors found a way to go deep, close, and personal to Al Gore. It holds a mirror to some deep inner Shakespearean tragedy that is Al Gore. And I think also it came at the right time. It opened up that raw emotion of how so many of us felt about Al Gore in 2006. And into that like weird emotional space, it hammered all this information about the melting polar ice caps. It's total alchemy why this film works. And the alchemy is of all of this is really, I would argue, what helped this film rise above the surface of the hypersaturated media market and get the message out, not just to those first concentric circles of people who would go see anything about global warming, and not just to the subsequent circles who you could buy with your marketing money, but really to a really large portion of the American population. It's alchemy, and as any good alchemist can tell you, it's really hard to replicate your results. I speak from experience. <laughs> to finish, I want to show you the trailer and a clip from a film that I, edit, I finished editing this spring. Um, the film is called Semper Fi, Always Faithful. It was directed by Rachel Liebert and Tony Hardman. Uh, it's Rachel's second film. It has just premiered um, this spring at the Tribeca Film Festival, and it's just beginning um, its life in the world. So whether it will have an impact remains uh, to be seen and is perhaps an interesting thing for us to talk about. And I'll, I'll talk when I show this about, about um, how that works. I think it's also interesting to show because the main character in the film hates to be called an activist. So he, um, he's even more conflicted about it than most documentary filmmakers. And so it's interesting. He becomes kind of, for the sake of this conversation, sort of a metaphor for the process as a whole. Also something that's interesting in this film is that he is on a quest not only um, for specific legislative and regulatory change, but also for kind of public awareness and outreach and those broader categories um, of, of public involvement. So we can talk about that. I'm going to show the trailer and then maybe fill in some, just to sort of cut to the chase, and then I'm gonna fill, maybe fill in some gaps in the story if I feel I need to, and um, see how that works. Uh, I really wish I could get to quick time here. Okay, well, we've been fine. I joined the Marine Corps in 1970, right out of high school. <coughs> oh, we're gonna need quick time for this, aren't we? Hmm. Applications? Sorry, I'm not a PC person. Yikes. 
I joined the Marine Corps in 1970, right out of high school. <clears throat> I lived that life, breathed it. I feel betrayed by the organization that I represented and that I served faithfully. The contaminants found in the water at Lejeune have been linked in scientific literature to birth defects and childhood cancer. My son was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was diagnosed with male breast cancer. My children, they both were just so very sick. They knew this about the water. Why they didn't tell us? I don't believe they should be hiding any information from this audience. None. This time last year, I was dying. The Marine Corps needs to get these people notified, and they need to tell them what happened. The Marine Corps has refused to notify their people, and I told them that if they didn't want to live up to their motto, I would. We weren't dumping toxic chemicals into the ground. D really? The Marine Corps has allowed me and thousands and hundreds of others to get devastating illnesses and die. These people knew this crap and they covered it up. This is the largest contamination in the history of our country. You can only keep a secret for so long. You ready? Uh, I was ready for this 10 years ago. So the main character, Jerry, is a um, U.S. Marine drill sergeant and he uh, lived on base on board Camp uh, Lejeune in North Carolina and his daughter was born there in 1975. She died of leukemia 10 years later and uh, 12 years after that he heard the first local news report um, about contamination in the drinking water uh, at Camp Lejeune when, when the EPA went in to start to clean it up. Um, he has been on a quest ever since then to get the the military to admit wrongdoing, to get help for victims, to get the word out to people who've been exposed to these chemicals, and this film follow, follows his quest. It's interesting, when I was looking for a piece to show of this film, I found the section that I'm going to show now, which comes after kind of a, a happy moment when he goes to one of his, when he testifies for one of the first times to Congress, and um, he gets to tell people what, what uh, he gets to tell his elected representatives what he thinks about that process, and, or what he, what he thinks, and then um, after that happens, he comments on the process. And I think it becomes sort of a metaphor for how the role of the media has changed and the role of these people has changed over time. Okay, I'm gonna do this in quick time, and I'm gonna set open. Marine Corps was Johnny on the spot with a three-page rebuttal of why they should not have to do notification. I mean, Semper Fi, you know? When we got the hearings, I was really expecting those to be the catalyst for more investigations and then ultimately get to the, you know, get to the truth. Well, I was wrong. People think, oh my God, a congressional hearing, boy, that's really something. They held the hearing, they got great accolades for it, uh, and then they dropped the ball. Unfortunately, I cannot get the senator to do a thing. He would not even, uh, they would not even take my phone calls. You know, the main thing is don't let this issue die.
I don't know how many of you know my history, but I was a career Marine. Uh, I did 24 and a half years in the Marine Corps. I never dreamed that I would be doing what I'm doing today. You know, when I first started this in 1997, I was by myself. The Marine Corps has refused to notify their people, and I told them that if they didn't want to live up to their motto, I would. All of you can help by taking the time to write a letter to your elected official. I've been wanting to meet you since I read your article in Jacksonville Daily News. That's what what about New River Air Station? I was there from 63 to 67. They were studying something that he got into at Catley Gym. This is my grandson. Except for five. You don't quit, you just keep going. Now go kick some damn doors down tomorrow. This film, um, I think that Jerry's frustrations and his success over time kind of reflects the same kind of frustrations and successes that documentary filmmakers have had. Uh, this film screen, um, when it showed at a film festival in Washington, D.C., they also had a screening on Capitol Hill for um, for lawmakers. And there is a bill in the works that it has more to do with Jerry than with the film. There's a bill um, in the works that was announced uh, at the premiere of the film um, to treat victims of Camp Lejeune the same way victims of Agent Orange are, are treated. Um, the frustrating thing is that this is not a good time for that kind of legislation because it costs money. Um, and that's sort of the depressing part. Um, but the happy part is that the film really is going out in the world. He has worked with uh, the Environmental Working Group, and the film is now being used by them, by something called the Blue Green Alliance, by the NRDC, to sort of show the film and get the word out to people. Um, and the, kind of the most amazing thing, if you, as they say, go to the Facebook page, there are wonderful lists of people writing in saying that either this film was the first time that they heard that they had been exposed to chemicals at Camp Lejeune, or that someone told them that they should see this film and they learned about it that way, or that they learned accidentally and they're so excited that there's a film that expresses sort of what they're going through. So um, I don't know that that's a necessarily a conclusion, but we're not at the end of the day. So um, I will uh, leave it at that um, and turn it over. Oh. for you while you're settling in. Although you might be better at that than I am. There you go. Thank you so much. Right. Hey everyone. Nice to be here this afternoon and evening. Purcell, that was extraordinary and a hard act to follow. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm Emily. I am so thrilled and honored to be here. I am a Princeton graduate. I am also a failed Woodrow Wilson applicant. <laughs> and so for any of you in the room whom that applies to, I will just say three things. Um, I was sitting in a bowl very much like this my senior year, uh, feeling not exactly thrilled about not having made the cut. And then White House Press Secretary Dee Dee Myers came to talk and started her speech off by telling the audience a very similar story. Life goes on, and it is possible to fulfill the Woody Woo mission, whatever you major in. So best of luck to you all. Um, it's not so long ago uh, that I was sitting here as a student, uh, namely 10 years ago. And uh, in thinking about how to talk to you about documentary films and social media, when I'm not a documentary filmmaker or a social media maven by any stretch, um, I thought, uh, well, it was, I, I suppose, surprising and uh, fortuitous uh, to look back at the spheres that I've worked in since Princeton and to realize uh, what a powerful role documentary film and social media have played. Um, namely, I remember being a second semester senior at Princeton 
um, and having spent significant time during my undergraduate years doing some very intense things overseas in conflict and post-conflict situations. Uh, worked on the Cyprus bicommunal peace movement, uh, then went to Rwanda with the Princeton in Africa program uh, to work with genocide orphans, and then did a senior thesis on the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I got to second semester senior year and felt a distinct compulsion to stick a little closer to home, to be nearer my friends, and to do something, for lack of a better word, more normal. Three weeks after joining ABC News in New York as a production assistant in an attempt to do these things, planes hit the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And my New York uh, normal conception was, was very much uh, thrown for a tailspin. I was put on the overnight news desk and helped first ABC News and then CNN to generate sometimes near 24-7 coverage of 9-11 post 9-11, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as a host of other subjects. Um, and we like to, especially at CNN, say that we work to look beyond the news of today in an attempt to answer the questions of tomorrow. Um, but you know, there's only so much you can do when you're confined to two or three minute news packages, sound bites. Um, only so much freedom when the entire uh, one hour program broadcast is branded and funded. And so I suppose uh, my first uh, takeaway, uh, the difference between documentary film and what we were doing, is that uh, news gives you breadth, documentaries give you depth. And here I'm speaking of films like Restrepo, uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, Gunner Palace, Last Letters Home, Baghdad or Bust, uh, uh, scores of, of very powerful films about those same, uh, those same events, uh, but really, really going much deeper. Um, that, and I would say that there's simply no medium more powerful than film. Um, it's a combination of words, pictures, music, stillness, um, and, and just amazingly intellectually, com in, excuse me, intellectually stimulating and emotionally compelling. Um, there's a reason why on American warships, uh, they're constantly playing war films on loop. Uh, they're inspiring. Uh, they motivate people to do something. And documentaries made well and executed thoughtfully are arguably even more powerful because of course they're dealing with, with real life. Um, moving on to CNN, as a producer, I got uh, the chance to try my hand at actually uh, doing some work of my own. And documentaries were constantly things that we were reporting on. Um, a few that spring to mind, uh, Normal People Scare Me. This is a film about a teenage boy named Taylor Cross who's autistic. And he teamed up with John Travolta's brother to do a film about what it was like to have autism. Uh, by interviewing 65 uh, people, family, friends, and other children with autism like himself. Um, another piece that uh, we worked on, uh, or reported on rather, Born into Brothels. Uh, this won the 77th Annual Academy Award for Best Documentary, and the film is the portrait of several unforgettable children whose mothers work in the red light district of Calcutta. Um, and I wanted to show just briefly the trailer from this film, uh, because it's such a, a unique uh, approach to doing a documentary. Uh, here, the filmmaker put cameras in the hands of the children. And so you see at their eye level view what it is like living in Calcutta. Um, the girls uh, very much being groomed to perhaps one day join the line themselves. <laughs> well. Sorry, hit F5. F5. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. It's almost impossible to photograph in the red light district. It's a whole separate society within itself. I mean, you just walk down that one lane and it's another world. And of course, as soon as I entered the brothels, I met the children. They were all over me, and I 
I'd play with them and take their photographs and they would take mine. That's when I thought it would be really great to teach them and to see this world through their eyes. From the perspective of eight children, led by the compassion of one woman. Take your time to look and make sure everything in the whole square looks good. She's really good at photographing on the street because she's very strong. Shakti. The children ask me for help. They ask for it all the time. And I mean, there's so little I can do. All I can do is try it. There's so much information in this picture. It's just a beautiful photograph. I'm not a social worker. I'm not a, a teacher, even. But without help, they're doomed. These kids want to be out of there. Are there any boarding schools that would take them? No place is the right place. Nobody will take them. From the streets of Calcutta. My goal now is to raise money for them using their own photography. To an auction block at Sotheby's. Are you excited? Yes. Oh, they're all here. Amazing. I think he's reached a critical point. And if he doesn't get out of there really soon, he's lost. You and you and you have been accepted into a school. Eight children. People ask me, why do I come and do this work? There's no rational reason. Born into brothels. Gopala, Gopala. Learn to see, learn to create, learn to hope. Think Film presents the story of a courageous vision and the children who made it happen. Born into brothels. So I suppose the takeaway for me uh, assisting in uh, producing news packages about uh, these two powerful films, the child's experience with autism and then uh, Born into Brothels was, uh, you know, as a news producer, you're dealing, uh, there's a great sleuthing aspect, no doubt, but you're often dealing with what's available. And these type of document documentaries propel uh, hidden issues um, or a, a subculture of children um, into the public sphere and, and make them available. Um, this was not something on anyone's radar, and it won an Academy Award, and, and that's just a, a very, uh, was a very powerful thing. Um, a final piece, actually my final piece at CNN, uh, was about a woman uh, who was coming to terms with her Nazi childhood. Um, she had been plucked from all the children in her village to sit on Hitler's knee, and years later, uh, in her 70s, wrote a book about it. Um, and while that was not about a documentary per se, um, we made a choice to take images from Lenny Reifenstahl's Triumph of the Will, uh, the most uh, successfully, most purely propagandist film ever made, in the words of Susan Sontag. And I suppose I bring that up only to propone uh, the idea that documentaries have such an enduring illustrative power. Um, because, of course, that film has become synonymous with the Nazi regime, uh, its horror, its insanity, uh, its power, and left us with some of the most enduring images of the Third Reich. Moving on, um, I reached a point uh, in News TV where I felt that there was maybe a, a different contribution uh, to make. And I uh, went on to take the best job of my life as a humanitarian journalist for the International Rescue Committee. Um, in that capacity, uh, it was phenomenal. Um, basically traveled around uh, African countries and also refugee communities in the United States, uh, shooting, writing, and producing very short advocacy films uh, and written pieces and blogging about issues such as sexual violence survivors, uh, child hunger, um, the lack of education in refugee camps, uh, water, well building, any, any number of things. Um, and I loved it and was very passionate about it. Um, but I also found it very difficult to collapse the distance that separated the viewer of these advocacy films uh, from the subjects. Miles, time zones, lack of seeming personal impact. Um, we would always end these pieces um, with sort of a, you know, write your congressman, sign this petition, donate your money and time. Um, but it often felt like the story that you were trying to tell was the story that no one wanted to hear. Um, contrast that with humanitarian documentaries, 
uh, we teamed up with uh, many documentary filmmakers uh, who were telling the same sorts of stories, but in longer uh, and extremely compelling ways. Um, one that I wanted to show you, uh, not a clip from the film itself, uh, but a clip of the subjects watching the film and reacting to it, is Lisa Jackson's The Greatest Silence, uh, in which a woman, who an American woman, who was herself uh, the victim of gang rape, went to the Congo to do a film on women there caught in the sexual crossfire. An extremely uh, compelling film, and, and as you'll see here, uh, not just to us viewers, but, but to the women who inspired it. You know, as much as we don't like to think about it this way, or might not think about it this way, one of documentary's chief uh, reasons, raisons d'etre, is, is to entertain. Of course, there are many different ways to be entertaining. It doesn't necessarily connote uh, something fun or funny, uh, but something very inspiring, shocking, moving. And I just bring this film up, or rather this reaction, to showcase the fact that The Greatest Silence did so well what we were trying to do ourselves, um, and often uh, in a Sisyphean manner, um, because Lisa Jackson here took what was most uh, personal and painful to her and offered us viewers a passport to a world where it was happening all the time. Um, in 2007, um, I got an extraordinary opportunity to actually assist uh, with a documentary. Um, it was called Darfur Now, and it chronicled the lives of six individuals who were attempting to bring an end to the crisis in Darfur. Uh, everyone from a 24-year-old waiter and activist to Hollywood actor Don Cheadle. Um, and I also brought a quick clip of this film, the trailer. Um, to show you again, uh, same subject, uh, different medium, and how powerful it, it really is. is deliberate targeting of civilians. Women were being raped. Villages were being bombarded. You, you learn about what's happened in the past, what happened in Nazi Germany, and here we've got a chance to make it right, and you've just fallen flat on your faces. Don't you know that time for words has drawn to a close? action desperately needs to take its place. My mandate is to investigate and prosecute the worst crimes in that world. My job is to provide food to save lives. It's part of my responsibility as a human being. 
Force of Genocide in Sudan and Darfur. Do a moment, sir. Sorry, I do. Okay. What's going on over there? It's absolutely critical to ensure that our taxpaying dollars aren't supporting and funding this genocide. Uh, I got an email from George Clooney. He was going to be going on a trip to China, then to Egypt. Our call today is that priorities be linked to human survival, not political process. Prosecution has concluded that Ahmad Haroun and Ali Kushib bear criminal responsibility for alleged crimes against humanity and war crimes. I'm gonna do whatever I can. There you go. Yeah. Get him. I'm sending two girls that will send a very clear message that California does not stand for murder and genocide. A difference is complicity. The young activist you see is actually a classmate of mine now at Berkeley Law School, and I'll tell you, it's a big honor to sit next to him in uh, contracts. <laughs> um, in any case, to button up the, uh, my humanitarian experience, uh, in 2009, uh, we got wind of a group of Iraqi musicians, heavy metal musicians, uh, who had been the stars of a documentary called Heavy Metal in Baghdad and a team at the International Rescue Committee, uh, we worked together to, we're gonna be split up, resettled in the United States, but split up, friendless, without family members, and without their para-family, which was, of course, themselves. And the ability to point to this film, which showed uh, their, their lives and, and suffering and, and struggle and triumph was, was a big uh, boon in making a case for them. Um, so I guess I just bring up some of these films to say, you know, a lot of documentaries are advocacy films. They're polemics, they're tools to create a campaign, awareness, etc. Uh, and and they, they do it well because they are simultaneously, uh, you know, entertaining us as we go. Um, third experience with documentary films uh, was uh, when I was uh, preparing to uh, co-author a book about the former child soldiers of Liberia. Um, I'd spent a lot of time in Liberia, but I hadn't been there during the war. I had lived with former child soldiers, but I hadn't been there when the stories of the things that they had done were, were being done. And I found the documentary um, Pray the Devil Back to Hell by Abigail Disney, which, yes, you're nodding here. It's, 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 a, it's a terrific one. Uh, very helpful in uh, trying to humanize a, a brutal subject. and. Uh, helping me see the before of the before and after story of, of these former combatants. Um, final experience with documentary film and, and how it's uh, uh, perforated uh, you know, my life. Um, I've just completed a, a stint at the uh, State Department in the Office of Policy Planning um, and helping on uh, post-Arab Spring uh, issues in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, it was surprising and truly heartening to see that documentaries really do make it up to you know, the, the highest levels. Uh, the first instance being en route to Capitol Hill to hear the assistant uh, ambassador for Near Eastern Affairs testify about Syria. Uh, his staff members uh, were discussing a documentary film they'd just seen the night before on PBS Frontline called Syria Undercover in which a young woman goes undercover and hides out in a protest organizer's safe house as Assad regime uh, soldiers come in and, and do a raid. Um, so I suppose the takeaway there would be uh, policymakers are shuttled to the front lines courtesy of documentaries. They might not themselves have the ability to go live in a mud hut in Darfur for six weeks or go to Syria, uh, but in an hour's time, a documentary can really take them there and at a cellular level show them what it is they're, they're working on. Um, finally, um, Persepolis. Uh, debatable, <laughs> whether it's a documentary, it's, it's an animated uh, cartoon film uh, about a, uh, an Iranian woman based on a book. How can we move forward to Sorry. these people? based on a book of the same name. Um, but many argue it is, and it's the story of this Iranian's woman, Iranian woman's coming of age uh, in, in Iran. And uh, critically, uh, in the course of this uh, film, God, or Allah, is shown as a cartoon uh, character 
which is deeply offensive to some conservative Muslims. Um, you may or may not be following the uh, post-Arab Spring elections, but if you have, uh, Tunisia has just gone through their first stage. And a couple of weeks before they did, uh, Persepolis, which had been available in the Arab world, uh, including Tunisia, in the stores shown in the movie theaters, etc., cetera, uh, was shown on uh, public television and resulted in isolated and quite violent demonstrations. Um, we got wind of this, keeping eyeballs on what's going on as a critical part of, of policy, policymakers' work, and uh, it was fascinating to be asked to look into the significance of these protests. How big were they? Were they one-off? Uh, and what did this mean for freedom of expression and democracy going forward? Um, who was behind it, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not able to speak uh, for the State Department, so I'll keep it there. Uh, but just, uh, again, a sort of um, interesting uh, intersection, documentary as, as bellwether or reference point for where the public or government stands on an issue uh, and something uh, people in DC are very cognizant of. That's all I've got. Uh, it's been an honor to be here, um, and thank you so much. <laughs>
I, I would agree and just add to that that the question of how real is the reality is one that's often asked of documentary films. Uh, Fahrenheit 9-11 went into the media's complicity in the lead up to war. So there's that. I don't know if we can ever know. Um, and I, I think one thing I was, one point I was uh, trying to make with the humanitarian <coughs> films, um, with the subjects like rape in the Congo or the crisis in Darfur, personal opinion is there's really no other side. Um, and so in those instances, um, while a cooler textbook definition of documentary might lead one to believe that it should be completely objective, balanced, you know, certainly the interviews in that film uh, would lead you to believe, rightly so, that, that something horrifying was going on. And while the other voices were included, they were not championed in the way that the six individuals and their constituencies were. Um, I would also say that perhaps these days, on your point, it's uh, we're able to um, enter and contribute to each other's conversations in a greater way. I didn't get to talk about uh, the uh, witnessing the social media uh, that's going on at the, the State Department, um, but they have, you know, they're tweeting in Farsi and Arabic and launching a virtual embassy soon in places where we can't have more of a presence. And so there's at least an ability to perhaps respond to, have a dialogue, et cetera, about uh, these films, perhaps in a way that there wasn't uh, when the Murrow films were being shown. Yeah. The Murrow clip uh, was done, you said, Thanksgiving 1960. That's the lame duck month of the Eisenhower administration going into the Kennedy. Kennedy was already elected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can say something about the political atmosphere, such as one created by the change of regime, whether it has anything to do with the uh, effectiveness of, of documentaries. Well, you know, it was interesting when I was sort of trying to think about what I wanted to say. I, I, I sort of skipped over between 1960 and 1994 really quickly, and I started looking at you know, I was trying to think about how did we get to, this is a roundabout answer, and let me know if I don't answer your question, but we, we st I started thinking about how we got to kind of the more personal documentaries that, that, we, that are shown now. And it was really interesting to me that a lot of the stuff that I was looking at, the stuff that was, that was really innovative in the 60s, like pri all those observational fly-on-the-wall documentaries, kind of came to be in a time that was really political and kind of in some way our most our most fly on the wall, most observational, most hands-off documentaries come from a time in this country's history that was incredible where everything was political. And it was really interesting to me to look at that and 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 see that, you know, I think that that now we're so, people want to say something so much, and there was so much being said in the 60s and 70s that, that documentary filmmakers seemed to feel like they could step back and sort of sit on the wall and just kind of show what was, what was happening. I don't, I, you could probably punch holes in that argument, but I thought it was kind of interesting um, as, as, a, as, a place to, as a place to start in that. You know, now I feel there are a couple things, there's this, um, there's a desire in documentary to kind of hold your hand and walk you through um, stories and to give a little, I don't know if it's celebrity or hand-holding or commentary, but really tell, telling people what, what to think. And um, I'm not sure if that's part of the political climate, part of a lack of trusting of the media, um, what that is, but that kind of fly on the wall observation is now often tempered with other commentary. Is that In the back? Yeah, I have a follow up on both of the questions. On, on the question of, of truth, it's, what I find most interesting is that, first of all, Triumph of the Will was not a documentary. Everything was staged in that movie and carefully directed by Leany Reisenstahl. And so when students see that movie, they often say it's a documentary. And at the same time, if you watch Battle of Algiers, most people have assumed for years that that also was a documentary. So this whole question of truth, to me, is a difficult one. And it really merges into the area of whether film in general, for example, you can, you can look at other mainstream films. During the McCarthy period, there was a film called Salt of the Earth, which was about a strike that took place 
in New Mexico, and it used actors as well as real participants in the strike. So it was a quasi-documentary. But the, the other thing I want to bring up is, is this, this transition that we've seen from documentaries <coughs> as being seen as some sort of collective action as opposed to documentaries that you refer to as personality. They, they follow an individual. And I, I wonder whether that says a great deal about the ideology that's behind the, the making of documentaries. For example, just recently because of what's going on on Wall Street and seeing the difficulty of going through what do you do in terms of mass movements if they fail, I've reviewed several documentaries. One was Berkeley in the 60s. The other was The Prairie Fire, which was the Haskell West School interview with the weather underground while they were underground. It was a post-weather ground. Uh, weather on-demand movie, and just recently there was a documentary on the Earth Liberation Front. And what I found interesting about those is that they, the weather underground ones tried to steer away from individual personalities towards collective action. The Earth Liberation one followed an individual as he was going through the court process. And I'm not sure that during the 60s we saw that type of personal narrative is developing a cult of personality away from activism that moved in a collective sense. So I think there's an aesthetic that also has an ideology behind it that I personally think has to be questioned carefully, that you can be just simply become a, a, a voyeur in watching someone else go through either good times or bad times. And in terms of the right the conservative movement, they're able also to make these kind of documents. And I think you, you really have to spend a little more time looking at the popular front movement and movies and documentaries that came out in the 30s and later 40s, and those early documentaries that were sponsored by uh, SO and others, the plow that broke the prairie, the one Louisiana story, uh, and how they manipulated, quote, truth. So I, <laughs> okay, okay, I'll give you an example because I kind of really agree with you in a lot of ways. You know, the, the personal story is really compelling to people now, but it's also just one person's story. I'll give you an example from this uh, film I just finished. So it's really important when you're, when you're raising money for films. One of, the th one of the things that funders say now is, you know, this is Sundance and Tribeca Fund, the, the big pots of money, they say, we want you to make the political personal. We want you to find someone who becomes an example for the story. You know, go out and find that person. So my director stumbled across this guy, and they make this story about this huge water contamination issue that, that is intensely personal. When we were, the things that we fought most about in the making of that film was how much to involve the government. Because something I felt really strongly was that, that you know, the reason why this water contamination was discovered in the first place was because of the Clean Water Act, you know, and, and, the, and the start of Superfund sites and the need to test your water by outside sources and the way the government went in to start to clean it up and then the way the government started to clean it up. There was this whole kind of huge armature of actually kind of, you know, you can say we should have more. I would say we should have more. But there is an enormous part of our government that really wonderfully regulates how, where our drinking water comes from and how it should be treated and, and how chemicals should be regulated. And to, to try to stick so closely to this one man's story on this one quest didn't really show the whole picture. And so we fought a lot in the edit room about, in fact, we actually took this one man to regulatory meetings that he knew about, but maybe was going to go to, maybe wasn't, because we wanted to show that he was part of, you know, a much, a much bigger process. And I think that that hmm. I agree with you that 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 is a really frustrating. You know, people always want, can you find three subjects who are all trying to do the same thing, or can it be sort of like a contest? You know, it's always this kind of thing. We want one story. And not only do I find that that undermines the importance of collective action. But I also think it gets really tiresome in media. You know, I sit there and I watch documentaries and, you know, it's like, okay, let's meet our three characters. You know, oh, let's send them on our journey. You know, it becomes this kind of trite thing, whereas I feel like there's so many ways to tell a good story. 
Um, Could you just say a little bit what, more then about funding? Because it's clear that if your artistic and aesthetic consider and political consideration is being hindered by the manner in which it's funded, mm -hmm. then it really, it's, you know, Edward R. Morrow being funded by Philip Morris, and yet there was nothing in, in, in the, uh, that uh, documentary that dealt with tobacco industry. It dealt with mm -hmm. the other parts of the food chain. So can we, can we let them comment on that? That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. I'm really going to hand most of these to you. <laughs> I, I'm not an expert on documentaries, but I just wanted to uh, uh, corroborate the point that at least from a news perspective, just the uh, importance of character-driven, character-driven, character-driven. However, I would point out uh, one uh, critically acclaimed film, 2010, Restrepo, which uh, I mentioned earlier on. Uh, that was uh, a unique um, compromise, I suppose, between the character-driven and the hands-off. I don't know if you all have seen that one, but it's a, a look at the Afghanistan uh, counterinsurgency actions, U.S. counterinsurgency actions in Afghanistan, the Korngal Valley, specifically a very violent and dangerous place. Um, it's done in the cinema verite style, so <clears throat> no narration, very little contextual background. Interviews, certainly, but, but they are not what's pounded home. It, it's much more watching these soldiers in this one outpost uh, live and, and deal with, with the violence there. And in that film, uh, we're introduced to the character whose name gives the film its, its title, Restrepo, who has been killed at the very beginning. And his character uh, really haunts and, and guides the story, but in a very uh, gentle way. So only putting that out there as, as maybe a, a recent and unique take on the character driven, but in a very background sense. Let me add to that, a lot changes in the field, uh, and just like in news television, uh, he or she who speaks loudest and most eloquently um, probably has a leg up in being cast, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, we went to Darfur to work on Darfur now with a unique casting uh, uh, dictate in mind. One of the characters was supposed to be a young Western aid worker who could speak uh, eloquently uh, about what it was like to be 20-something in the field in the world's then worst humanitarian crisis. We got to Darfur and quickly realized that of the four Irish, Canadian, Australian, and American uh, young women uh, that we had tried to vet uh, through shoddy sat phone connections, et cetera, uh, would not speak or rather they would speak, but in very terse, uh, staid sound bites, both because they had been, I'd say, overcome by the paranoia of working there, but mostly because they were very concerned about the effect saying anything that did not accord with what we were told we could say safely would have on the beneficiaries, i.e. the displaced people with whom they worked. And so going over there to cast Helen or uh, I, I can't remember their names, but, but four women later, it just wasn't working. And so the character who ended up being cast was actually the leader of a group of displaced people in Zalinji Darfur, who very valiantly said, let them kill me, let them come, I will speak the truth, totally unedited, uh, and, and, and would uh, tell us that story. But that's a good example of a conception, funded, scripted, proposal in, in the field, everything changed. And we're gonna cut that section about how you don't care what your funder thinks from, <laughs> from the tape that we're doing. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> the 17 minutes. Are there other questions? Yeah. Um, thanks for this, this has been great. I wanted to ask both of you to maybe speak a little more critically on what constitutes success for a documentary film. So uh, you both used Inconvenient Truth and Darfur Now as examples of successful documentaries. I, I think I'm interpreting that right. But um, it seems to me like we kind of sometimes confuse the number of people who become aware of an issue with more ambitious goals like actually changing the policy space. So do you think those two specifically were actually successful and, and what actually makes them different from a lot of other movies that <coughs> have achieved just as much acclaim but are maybe not remembered for, for some reason? 
Well, you know, the U.S. hasn't signed the Kyoto Protocol, so I'd say no, <laughs> you know. But on the other hand, um, I, I think that, you, that filmmakers should make movies about whatever they want to make movies about. And, um, and that you should be able to make a film about global warming um, without having to solve the problem. You know, I mean, no one's at that. That's kind of like maybe why you're becoming a lawyer because, you know, our <laughs> filmmakers, that's not really what we do at the end of the day. And so um, I think that they're like wildly successful films that, that, you know, I love, that people love, that are critically successful, that don't have this kind of call call to action, you know, or, or that, that have a much looser kind of view of their place in the world and I would argue that Hoop Dreams is one of them. I think that you know Steve James really really, really believes that that his film about African Americans playing basketball is about the inner city, it's about being young, it's about not having a place to go, it's about what should we do for those people. You know, those people are still in the inner city and and not necessarily those two, but you know but it's still an incredibly successful film and I think that, that just because certain funders want these metrics, they want to be able to measure their success, you know, again, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily, we don't, all don't have to subscribe to those equations, you know. One more question? No? I'll, I'll just add to that real quickly. Success is such a personal definition. Does it change a law? Does it channel some funding to the ghetto of Calcutta? Um, does it change one life? Does it change the way that men and women think about rape? Um, so many ways to define, really hard to say, and probably you know up to the individual to assess at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if there's one thing I can be sure of, it's, it's certainly watching those women at Ponzi Hospital, yeah, seeing their amazing. lives, you know, glorified, chronicled, you know, and, and just the viral effect, not web-based, but the viral effect that, that that film is having in, in the DRC. Yeah, we haven't really talked about the people who appear in documentaries and how, how films change their lives. Um, because that's not really public policy, but it's an incredibly important part of, of films, how they change, how, you know, sometimes for the worse, but often for the better, and just an opportunity. I mean, that's the kind of the thing that, that I love, is this opportunity, this moment that, like, you, this person working wherever, gets to be, you know, you get immortalized in this incredible way that, that and, and also, you know, hard to quantify, right? But look at some of the triumphs that were captured in some of the documentaries uh, shown today. Darfur Now, Adam Sterling, a young waiter, you know, with a clipboard in the street, made it all the way up to Governor Schwarzenegger's office and convinced him to divest from Sudanese companies. Now, maybe that would have happened without the film, but I dare say that the spotlight of, you know, a you know, Hollywood documentary probably helped. Uh, heavy metal in Baghdad. Again, I, I you know, reference that as, as certainly a, a piece that elevated a case of a group of refugees who were uh, really um, in dire straits. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. Box office hit, highest grossing, changing laws, but also very much changing lives. Yeah, you know, Triumph of the Will, that like fabulous piece of propaganda, most the most successful piece of propaganda, I think it was used even more than as its own film. It was cut up and put into U.S newsreels denouncing Triumph of the Will. So, you know, be careful what you put out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that last note, be careful what you put out there. Uh, we're going to end. Thank you very much for uh, sharing.